Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, December 22nd, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Today on the Storm Center, we got a quick diary by Rick regarding openportstats.com. That domain claims to be part of a research organization scanning the internet for open port. And of course, we do have a number of similar organizations, probably most prominently Shodan, Sensic, and the like. What differentiates this particular organization somewhat is that their port scans can be rather aggressive and as Rick has observed earlier this year they can pretty much amount to a denial of service attack. To make things worse the email addresses listed on their webpage are not working they're just bouncing with a server not available error. Now on the Internet Storm Center, as a part of our API, we do have uh, lists of IP addresses used by researchers to scan the internet. Open port stats is included in that list. So if you would like to block them, you could consider using that list or you could also consider blocking the AS used by this group, 202,425. Of course, there may be some collateral damage here if you're blocking the entire ASN. And Dell today released patches for the Dell Wise Thin OS uh, clients. Uh, these are thin clients that uh, are often used in healthcare in order to provide access uh, to cloud based applications. Security company CyberMDX that deals in the healthcare space has identified vulnerabilities that could lead to a compromise of these clients. Now, of course, sadly, they're sort of advertised as secure terminals uh, because there's really very little kind of going on on the actual terminal the applications are all hosted in the cloud but of course taking over the terminal still provides an attacker with access potentially to these cloud-based applications the main problem here is that Dell recommends that firmware images and configuration files are stored on an open FTP server that's just accessed via an anonymous account. That's sort of one of those 90s style vulnerabilities. And while the firmware images themselves are digitally signed, the INI configuration files are not. And pretty much everything happening on these devices is controlled via these INI devices. Uh, the uh, Dell configuration guide is a quite lengthy document and parameters, for example, include DNS settings, but also settings for VNC, the virtual network computing software that's being used for remote access. So all of that uh, could pretty easily be compromised via uh, this insecure FTP server. The advisory published by Dell pretty much suggests that users should use HTTPS instead of HTTP and FTP, which is used by default by these devices. Also making sure that the FTP server only allows read access and not write access, which could of course then be used to overwrite these INI files. And like couple sort of smaller updates about solar winds. Uh, first of all, a blog post by Microsoft sort of caused uh, some confusion, excitement, whatever you want to call it, that there is possibly a second uh, DLL that was introduced via solar wind. And this uh, DLL does implement a fairly straightforward uh, backdoor, but does require access to the solar wind console. This second DLL, only so far Microsoft has reported about it, so not clear if that was as widely distributed as the first uh, DLL. So far, it's also not really clear if that second DLL was ever used to attack anybody. It also appears to be originating from different authors. So really a lot of questions open about uh, that particular file. And the best numbers I've seen so far appear that about 18,000 customers of SolarWinds, so 
basically 18,000 different organizations did download uh, the backdoored version of Solar Winds. Now there's some little bit new work that looked at uh, the domain names that were being used or the host names being used by the command control server and try to find some of them in passive uh, DNS data. While passive DNS data is not sort of 100% complete normally, they did find about a thousand different uh, organizations that they were able to recognize in uh, DNS data in the past. I'll link in the show notes uh, to the blog post that sort of takes apart uh, these domain names. Of course, our handler, John Bambanek, uh, did uh, create a GitHub repository with some of this passive DNS data. So you could then use that in by using this blog post to figure out if your organization may have been affected. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. And remember that we'll only have uh, three podcasts this week due to the holidays. So tomorrow's will be the last one for the week.